The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. Running back Ray Rice appears to take a swing, knocking her out cold. The story that's outraged the nation. This is not just an NFL problem. A former teammate speaks out. This is not the Ray Rice that you know. Not at all. He's not a violent guy. Plus, a violent marriage. It just hits you that one of us is going to get shot. Turns deadly. I thought it would be him telling his story and I'd be in the morgue. Football star Ray Rice and his wife Janae are at the center of a domestic violence firestorm that has outraged the nation. Running back Ray Rice suspended from playing after the release of a new shocking videotape. Video surfaced of him dragging her unconscious out of a casino elevator. Ray Rice was suspended for only two games. I made a huge mistake and I want to own it. You know, these two games are going to hurt. It is the video sending shockwaves through the National Football League. Ravens running back Ray Rice appears to take a swing at his then fiance, now wife Janae, knocking her out cold. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell increased the two-game suspension to six, but this video prompted the Ravens to fire Rice and the NFL to suspend him indefinitely. Rice got no jail time. His wife even apologized. I do deeply regret the role that I played in the incident that night. And Rice's lawyer seemed partly to blame her. Ray wasn't the first person that hit, and Ray was getting repeatedly hit, but just Ray hit harder, fired one back and hit harder. Today, wife Janae Rice lashed out on Instagram to make us relive a moment in our lives that we regret every Every day is a horrible thing. Just know we will continue to grow and show the world what true love is. And aside from losing his salary, Rice is also losing endorsements. Today, Nike severed business ties with Ray Rice. Well, I have a truth for Commissioner Goodell and the NFL. People are so upset because when it comes to domestic violence, there are no sidelines, only sides. You either clearly are intolerant or you put profits and on-field performance ahead of human dignity. This is definitely a teachable moment in America. Millions of people, men, women, and very importantly, children, are watching how this drama unfolds. Every player, coach, and owner has a chance to make a bold statement that says, we have a moral compass, and violence against women is a deal breaker and will not be tolerated, period. It is time to be worthy of the adulation you are afforded. There are no sidelines, only sides. Pick the right side in a clear way and put action behind words and policy. There has been all of this controversy about when the NFL saw the tape. You know what? Wrong question. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference when it was seen. Take or no take, the NFL knew what happened. They should not need to see it on tape to know it constitutes a serious moral and criminal transgression. Stop deflecting and own the failure to act appropriately. And by the way, if you wanted the tape, you could have gotten it from Mr. Rice because you can bet that he and his lawyer had a copy. You need to send a message that you are serious about domestic violence being unacceptable. So far, that message has not been sent. Case in point, just this past Sunday, two NFL players were set to take the field with domestic violence issues hanging over their heads. Another NFL player is facing domestic violence charges. Ray McDonald, defensive end for the San Francisco 49ers, was arrested at his home overnight. His fiance, who's pregnant, showed police bruising on her neck and arms. The Panthers player was arrested on charges that he assaulted his girlfriend. Nicole Holder said Hardy dragged her by her hair, threw her on a futon where guns were sitting, choked her, and threatened to kill her. In July, a judge found him guilty of assaulting his girlfriend, but the team has not disciplined Hardy. A stunning last-minute decision for the Panthers. Greg Hardy benched just two hours before today's game. This is a very difficult situation that the league is dealing with right now. They were not infallible. We make mistakes. Well, you made one there. This is not just an NFL problem. In fact, by the end of this sentence, in the next minute, 24 people will be harmed by an intimate partner. That's 1,440 people an hour. 
34,560 a day. That's more than 12 million a year. Three women are killed daily in America from domestic violence incidents. I do want to say to the NFL, come on guys, teachable moment here. This is a $250 billion industry that impacts America. Be role models, be examples. Allowing this element inside the game cheapens the league and it reflects negatively on the vast majority of fine men that play in the NFL. You at the NFL do so much good. You, you give millions and millions to charity every year. Adopt this cause. As I can tell you, I have. When I started Dr. Phil's show, I said we would shine a bright light on the silent epidemics in America. None more important than domestic violence. In fact, thank you. In fact, we created a campaign called End the Silence on Domestic Violence. And during our time on the air, we have provided millions of dollars in resources and have done hundreds of hours of programming on domestic violence. Take a look. A woman tries to get away from the father of her child minutes before he sets her on fire. He beat her so badly, her mother did not recognize her. Every bone in my face had been broken. My face was ripped from the bone. He bit my ear off. Tossed her around, choked her, headbutted her. Why don't you just get a divorce and leave? Because she's my soulmate. I opened the door. He had a butcher knife in his hand. I didn't even really realize that I had lost my eye. When he backed the dog into a corner, he's going to bite. The things you've spoken about, do you think they're reasonable? They're and right. that you wouldn't slap her if she didn't nag so much. Do you think that's a reasonable position? Yes. Do you think it is a reasonable position? No! I really don't care what they say. No judgment. Christopher Haney doused his wife, Audrey Mabry, with flammable liquid. He tossed the candle at me, and I went up in flames. He started chopping me in the back of the head with a machete. The injuries authorities say were caused by this woman's husband. We begin to tell the tale of the deadly scene that unfolded here. I am so scared of my boyfriend, Danny, that I allow him to severely abuse me on a daily basis. I don't like you're protected every second up there, so say exactly what you want to say to him. I'm taking my life back from you. You don't deserve me. This is a call for action. So I have noticed a disturbing development in the reporting and dialogue concerning the Ray Rice story. His wife, Janae, has been harshly criticized because she chose not to leave him. Well, let me tell you, every single situation is different, and critics don't understand how challenging this situation can be. Now, I have asked my wife, Robin, to join me today. Robin is so devoted to this cause. Last year, she created a foundation named after her mother called When Georgia Smiled, which is totally devoted to the education and prevention of domestic violence and the support of victims. So, Rob, what jumps out to you about this situation from a female perspective? In that tape, one of the huge things to me is bystander responsibility. I saw on that tape, sadly, at the end when Janae is sitting there in desperate need of help, so many men just stared at her. And I think that's very important for everyone to know that when you just stand and watch someone being abused, you're really just as guilty as the one doing the abusing. And it was finally a woman that walked up and helped her. Well, th that is disturbing. You were the first one when all of this was coming out about Janae and people tearing her up for some of the things that she had said. The truth is, leaving's just not that easy. It is not that easy, and I, I do feel sorry that she's going through all of this, um, this criticism because victims of domestic violence are often isolated. They're cut off from their support systems and their resources, and people have to remember that. Victims of domestic violence often have their self-esteem and their self
self-worth undermined. They are often threatened with their own life if they try to leave. They are threatened with harm to their children and to their other family members if they try to leave. You adopt shelters. You donate money to shelters where women can go. You, you donate money so they have legal representation for restraining orders and things like that, uh, which is great work. And you say that it's also extremely dangerous during this time when they're actually making the separation. That is the most dangerous time. In fact, it is called separation assault. So 70% of women's injuries in domestic violence situations occur after they leave their abuser. See, the abuser panics and tries to assert that control and goes after them even more. Isolation is their number one tool. And when their victim is able to break away, that makes them even more, more aggressive. 50% of women murdered in domestic violence situations are killed after they leave. There is a right way and a wrong way to separate from an abuser. And there is help out there and support for you and to show you how to do it safely. Safety is the number one most important thing to remember. Okay. Safety. Uh, the first project that the When Georgia Smiled Foundation undertook was to create something called the Aspire Initiative. And yes. the Aspire Initiative is an educational program to teach uh, people about domestic violence, what it is, uh, how to recognize it, red flags, how to leave. Th this is a program that's being used now where? In schools? Schools, churches, um, any organization can use it in homes with your family by yourself. And it, you know, a lot of studies have shown that a lot of people don't even know that they're in an abusive relationship. And so this program was designed for young children, young adults, and even grown women like myself. Just anyone can use it in the privacy of your own home or with a large group. You, you can just enter the Aspire Initiative program uh, on whengeorgiasmile.org or drphil.com, anywhere that, that, that we have it. Yes. Uh, also, also, no, we're going to have links up. You're seeing them on the bottom of the screen. The National Domestic Violence Hotline is there for you. The National Network to End uh, Domestic Violence. These things are available for you. We will have links to them on our sites on When Georgia Smiled. All right, up next, he played alongside Ray Rice on The Ravens. His own sister died at the hands of an abusive ex-boyfriend. Now, what one former NFL player says Ray has confided in him since the scandal broke. This is not the Ray Rice that you know. Not at all. When I actually seen the video, I was very lost for words because being in that locker room with Ray for two years, you don't see that. Now, the shocking video of Ray Rice punching and dragging his unconscious wife needs to serve as a reminder that domestic violence is a huge issue that we cannot ignore, although the NFL seems to have a little trouble getting their focus on it sometimes. Now, Commissioner Roger Goodell denied having seen the full tape. Here's what he said just over a week ago. So did anyone in the NFL see the second videotape? To my knowledge, we were not granted that. Uh, we were told that that was not something we would have access to. When we met with Ray Rice and his representatives, it was ambiguous about what actually happened. But what was ambiguous about her laying unconscious on the floor being dragged out by her feet? That was the result that we saw. We did not know what led up to that. Joining me now is Chris Johnson and his wife, Miyoshi Johnson, founder of the organization Pretty Smart Girls. Um, now, uh, Chris and Miyoshi are good friends of Ray and Janae Rice. Chris, who is now retired, played with Ray uh, on the Baltimore Ravens, and sadly, Chris's sister uh, was a victim of domestic violence. In fact, she was shot and killed. Uh, by her ex-boyfriend. So, Chris, this hits really home for you, right? Yes, it does. You two have watched how this has unfolded. What's going on here with the NFL? Let's talk about that first. Um, 
I think I feel right now that the NFL actually need to make a program. Uh, they have one program a year called the Rookie, Rookie Symposium, and it teaches you more about finances than young men coming into this league about domestic violence. And I think as we move forward, I think that people that have been through domestic violence that can help these young men, mentor these men on a monthly basis, I think that that's what they need to go towards and try to fix right now. Look, look, you were surprised when you saw this because this is not uh, the Ray Rice that you know. Not at all. Um, when I actually seen the video, I was very um, lost for words because being in that locker room with Ray for two years, uh, you don't see that. You, he's not a guy, a violent guy. Uh, Janae is not a violent woman. Um, I think in that instance it was alcohol involved and some tempers flared and he made a terrible mistake that the nation not right now is trying to put his face on domestic violence and it's not a domestic violence against Ray, it's, it's, it's a nationwide issue, not a NFL or Ray Rice issue right now. Right. Uh, Miyoshi, you've talked to Janae since all of this happened and since all of this broke. What, what does she have to say about this? Going through these seven months with her, as any friend would, it's been, it's been hardening. It's been times where we've had to have hard conversations and cry together and pray together. But I do know that they've been going to counseling and therapy to move past this. And you and Robin were talking earlier that you think that she is being vilified in the media unfairly, correct? Uh -huh. What I said was, um, in a time when you're suffering from domestic violence, that's the time when you need support, you need your family, you need your friends, you need your co coworkers, anyone, especially the public, mm -hmm. to come around you and gather and support you. And I feel like she's not getting that. I feel like she's getting nothing but criticism and uh, being just really torn down for this. And right. I feel like this is a time when we all need to support her. Mm -hmm. She is a victim. And I just think that this whole media frenzy puts so much emphasis on exploiting Janae as the victim that we miss the whole teaching point of domestic violence is a terrible epidemic. We need some help. We need some answers. And you said one of the things Janae is concerned about is she does not want to be classified as a stupid person who stayed. Right. She's crazy. She's stupid. She's a battered woman. You know, we've heard it all. And none of that pertains to any of the women who are victims. They can be survivors. They can be, they can overcome this. But what is in place to help them to get to that point? Because ridicule and criticism doesn't help anything. Uh, you have also lost a family member to domestic violence. You had a cousin that was murdered, correct? Yes, After she left after she left after the divorce after the separation and your loss was after she left correct yes it was um they actually was split and you know when i heard that percentage 70 percent um it hit home because at that time she, she was wanting to leave and for someone to take another person's life because you don't want to be with them. I, I, I can't understand how men do that. I really don't. And wasn't that the first time he abused her was when he killed her? That was the first time. Verbal, it was a lot. And I've seen that. Uh, but as a brother, to see that and then being away where I couldn't do anything, um, that's why people need to understand how serious the domestic violence is, how it can turn a person, not that one person, but the whole family upside down in seconds. Why Chris says he forgives the man who killed his sister. Next. He shot her and I couldn't do anything. And I felt like I felt my mom because I wasn't there at the time my family needed me. As much as I wanted to hurt this guy, I had to pray for him. My question for Janae Rice is, why do you feel like your value is low enough that you would stay with a person who abuses you? I believe
believe that Janae stayed with Ray Rice because, one, she probably does love him. Two, she felt that she had a lot invested in that relationship. Three, they had a child together. And four, she probably wanted the lifestyle of being an NFL player's wife. It's really um, the perfect case of, of being a victim. You know, when, when the media started to criticize Janae, a lot of people reacted. And Beverly Gooden heard about the Ray Rice story and was furious that people were criticizing Janae for not leaving. She created a hashtag, hashtag why I stayed, uh, which got an incredible response. And uh, Beverly is with us today. So welcome, Beverly Gooden, to the show. Now, why did you create this hashtag why I stayed? Well, I was in a domestic violence marriage and um, when the video came out, the response was overwhelmingly on Janae. It was, why did she not leave him? Why did she stay? She's stupid. I would never stay with someone who hit me like that. All of that, the focus was on her and her actions as opposed to him and his actions. And so as someone who survived domestic violence, my first reaction was anger. I wanted to defend, you know, all survivors of domestic violence. I wanted to show that there are a multitude of reasons why we stay. You know, there are varied reasons why we stay. I stayed because I loved my husband. You know, I, I stayed because he controlled the finances. I had many reasons. And so I just, you know, without thinking, just put out a statement about why I stayed and tagged it why I stayed. And then all of a sudden, women and men from all over the place started to um, respond to the hashtag and say why they stayed. How long did it take you to successfully get away? Um, it took about, the violence started in November of 2008. I didn't leave until December of 2010. So it was that whole time. Um, once I decided that I knew he was going to end my life, that this wasn't a one-time thing, that this was, you know, over and over again, and that I could die. It took me about two months, and I did exactly what Robin was saying. I went to domestic violence websites, and I figured out how I could effectively leave. Um, I made an escape plan. I had an escape bag, clothes in the bag, um, medicines, toiletries, all of that, and then I just left. It took about two months, but I had to have a plan, and that was important. Now, there were times that you had tried to leave before that. He would not let you leave. No. You know, the first time I tried to leave, he actually slept in front of the front door the whole night so that I couldn't get out. Uh, Y'all see why I say this is a teachable moment in America? Th th it's so important to hear that. And Chris, your sister, y y you can just hear these words echoing from your sister. I mean, you're gone. She's alone. You had already warned him to leave your sister alone, right? Yes, uh, I, I warned him probably five months before that. And I received a call when I was in the meeting and said that he shot her. And I'm thinking, personally, you know, my mom, she don't know what she's talking about, you know. And I called, and next thing I know, my mom was shot. Um, he tried to kill both of them. And at the same time, I just went in a frenzy where I had to get home. When I got there and to see my mom break down, to see her daughter get killed like a dog in front of her, I couldn't do anything. And I felt like I felt my mom because I wasn't there at the time my family needed me. And as much as I wanted to hurt this guy, I had to pray for him because I would hurt my family. So at the same time, we went to court, you know, I want the guy to get the death penalty. You want the people to suffer just like you're suffering. But as a Christian, I had to forgive him because if I didn't, he always have that on my life. So he got life, but he still get to get up every day, brush his teeth, watch TV, walk around. And I have two beautiful nieces that will never see their mom again. And like I said, this is something that the world needs to understand. If you have any rage against a woman, get help. It's, it's, it's too many outlets in this world to get help and to stop touching these women. Well, and you know, it, it's... Thank you for that. And again, both of y'all lost people through this separation assault phenomenon that we're talking about, which is why your message, why I stayed, is so critically important. And look, I am not 
uh, somebody that wants to bash the NFL. I, I'm a huge. I, I went to college on a football scholarship. I wasn't very good, but I <laughs> college on football scholarship, so I never got very close to the NFL. Uh, but I, I'm a, I think it's a wonderful institution in America. I'm also. I'm not even a critic of Roger Goodell. I think he's just lost focus at this point, and need, it's what it's what happens now. I, that's why I said it doesn't matter whether when they saw the tape or what it's what you do no. now they need to take action clearly now this is a time to quit mamby pamming around and step up and send a clear message like you said we need to train these right. young guys mm -hmm. they that, that's why robin created the aspire initiative to train these boys in school before they even get to dating age right. to say it's not right y'all have seen the aspire initiative you know what's in there this is to prevent it as well as help people that are there all of us need to do that coming up in an exclusive interview we'll hear from a woman facing 20 years to life in prison why she claims it's all because of her abusive husband. Next. I had told Brian in the middle of our fight, I wish you were dead. He said, I can make that wish come true. So I picked up the gun and I fired. How many times did you shoot? Probably three or four. I think he's dead. Dead. My next guest has never given an interview before today. On the surface, she looks like a fun-loving Texan, but the reason she made news might surprise you. This is where the shooting happened, in the home where Trishel and Brian live. At 10.30 Monday night, Burnett County investigators say she called 911 and told the dispatcher she shot Brian. Yeah, How many times did you shoot? Probably three or four. Trishel says she was trying to give him CPR. Oh, okay, does he have blood coming out of his mouth? Blood out of his mouth. Okay. Online public records show Brian has been arrested for domestic violence. And this booking photo is from a drunk driving arrest in Burnett County last year. Trishel typed five hours before the shooting. I really hate him. Have someone dig a hole and I'll do the rest. He's dying. Uh, he was dead. I killed my husband. Trishel says she never meant to kill her husband. She just meant to graze him on the leg like she's seen on crime TV shows. I wish I had never shot and killed my husband. On July 1st, I told him, I wish you were dead. He said, I can make that wish come true. He picked up the gun and brought it into the bathroom and set it down next to me. He said, if you're such a big shot, do it. Kill me. I was afraid, like I had been many, many times in the past, that these fights are going to eventually escalate to the point where I get killed. So I picked up the gun and I emptied the whole thing into my closet door. He said, I can shoot you now and say it's self-defense and never spend a day in jail. So he starts loading the gun again. And he said, I have a full magazine. If you can get it, I dare you to try. So I tried to get past him to leave. He goes, run, chicken, run. And so I stopped at that point. And I was like, you know what? I would rather die and let him go to jail for this. And so I just started coming towards him. And I was like, kill me then. Just kill me. And he stumbled. We wrestled over the gun. And I got the gun. So so he stood back up and said, that's the gun you shot, I'll go get mine. And he got up to go get his gun. So I picked up the gun and I fired. I shot three times, once on this side, once on this side. And then when he was coming at me again, I shot down lower at this side. And I believe that's the one that got him. Okay, joining us via satellite now is Trishel. Uh, Trishel, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Um, at this point, you're on satellite be instead of here in person. Why? Um, I have a limitation on how far I can go. I have two ankle monitors on my ankles preventing me from going any further than a 20-mile radius. Okay. And all of this is while you are ra awaiting trial, correct? That's correct. So you're essentially under house arrest. And what are you charged with at this point? I'm charged with first-degree murder. Okay. Do you believe 
that if you had not done what you did that night, that, that day, that you would have been killed? I know, I know for a fact I would have been. He was going for his gun to shoot me. He had started bringing guns out during the argument? He would, he would get a gun and lay it out? Yes. There, towards the end, it, um, he started getting guns out and laying them around. And everybody would warn me and say, you know, this is going to end badly, Trishel. You need to get out. You need to leave. And I just always thought it was talk, you know. And I, I loved him. I, I didn't want to believe that he would actually hurt me. Why did you stay? I loved him. Uh, he was my whole life. We had, we ran a business together. Um, we, I was... He was my best friend. When he was in a good mood and happy, he was smiling and, you know, laughing and he'd make everybody around him happy and laugh. He was generous, you know, he was an all around good guy. But when he carried a lot of stress and he didn't know how to handle that stress very well. And at the end of the day, anything could set him off and I was the target. When it hits you that day, Trishel, that this is it, uh, I mean, uh, one of us is going to get shot here. Did yes. you did you ever think it would actually get to that point? I, I did, but I always thought it would be him sitting telling his story and I'd be in the morgue. Mm. All right, up next, why Trichelle says she's not like other criminals. We'll be right back. feel like I'm the type of woman that belongs in jail. I like to host parties. I like to wear high heels. I like to get dressed up, get my hair done, put on nails. And right now, I'm a criminal. I won't even watch Orange is the New Black, where you see these women who rape other women and make them their girlfriends. It just seems like it's more punishment for something that I've already been through enough. Well, that was Trichelle, who's facing 20 years to life in prison for first-degree murder after shooting and killing her husband, Brian, a little over a year ago. She says she's truly terrified of what will happen in jail. Now, Trichelle is currently out on bail awaiting trial, and so she's joining us on satellite. Did you reach out to resources? Did you do any of that? We did. We, um, we've been to three different. We first visited our preacher and spoke with him, and he referred us to a Christian counselor. And we went to go see him, and Brian said he was a quack. And so then um, we found a therapist that we were both uh, seeing at the, at the time that it happened. Mm -hmm. And was any progress being made? I feel like it, it was starting to help, but, you know, I don't think he really thought he had a problem. He just thought most of the time that it was me and that if we got help, that I would get help and I would learn how to quit antagonizing him. So you were the antagonizer in his eyes. You made him do this. Every time. I, it was my fault. Always. Well, Trichelle says that while she regrets shooting her husband, obviously and clearly, uh, she doesn't uh, regret the way that he used to treat her. Brian stood about six, four and a half, and he weighed 300 pounds. So when he got mad, he was like a bulldozer coming at me. He would pull my hair, bang my head into the ground repeatedly, choke me against the wall. There were several times that Brian gave me black eyes. One time we got into a fight on the way home from his brother's house. He reached over and slammed my head into the glove box. I reached over and pulled the steering wheel. He jumped out of the truck and tried to pull me out, but I locked the doors and called 911. He kept begging me, begging me, please, please let me in so I opened up the door and he jerked me out of the truck and started kicking me and beating me up on the side of the road usually the next day he would apologize and tell me that I drove him to the point of hitting me because I knew that he couldn't control his temper according to Brian it was always my fault did you ever consider running Many times. And then he would start calling, you know, I'm sorry, you know, please come back. I, I'm going to get help. We're going to get better. We'll get through this. Yeah, so you got talked back in. 
Oh, definitely. But I loved him. I wanted to go back. I wanted to believe that he would get help and things were going to someday be better. It isn't always just physical, and it can go from verbal to deadly like that. Right. And that's what happened with your sister, Chris. She had not been hit before, but she had gone through a lot of verbal abuse. A, a lot of verbal abuse, um, emotional abuse, and he never touched her until that day he shot her five times. Yeah. So don't think it's just not that bad if you're not getting hit. All right, we're going to take a break. Next, Robin has an exciting announcement you won't want to miss. And what Trichelle wants to tell other women who are being abused. We'll be right back. I would like other abused women to know from my story, the man never changes. The man doesn't outgrow it. The man doesn't mean it when he says he'll never do it again. He's going to do it again and again and again. You either have to get out or end up like me. Or worse, end up dead. like we've seen in the news lately are exactly why Robin started her foundation when Georgia smiled last year. Its mission is to help empower and stand up for anyone who is being abused or neglected. Now, when Georgia smiled launched a very exciting program designed to stop domestic violence, it's called the Aspire Initiative, which is an interactive curriculum for all ages. It's been set up for different ages. The Aspire Initiative includes a potentially life-saving free smartphone app that's called Aspire News, and it's available in the iTunes Store and through Google Play and at WhenGeorgiaSmiled.org that allows the user to create a pre-written text or voice message to be sent to designated numbers. It can be 911 or others. And the reason we say or others, maybe you're not ready to call the cops. But things are getting heated and you want your neighbor or your mom or a friend to come, you can set these text messages up and all you have to do is tap a button and there's a knock at the door and you, you have an out. And when you start the go button, it also starts recording to capture details of what's going on in the room because you may need those at some point. And by the way, this appears like any other app on your phone. Uh, so to an untrained eye, it's just, you know, it's just there. It's not anything that has to do with domestic violence. And um, interestingly, the app was recognized on Capitol Hill by the National Health Collaborative on Violence and Abuse as one of two apps in 2014 most beneficial to fight to end domestic violence. Robin is also has a very exciting announcement. That's right, Philip. From September 8th through October 15th, college students across the U.S. can enter the hashtag IAspire and enter to win a grant up to $5,000 to help further their efforts to raise awareness about sexual violence and relationship abuse on college campuses. And students can enter the challenge by going to studentsoftheworld.org backslash IAspire. 
or you can also go to WinGeorgiaSmile.org and DrPhil.com. And what we want you to do is create a video telling us your story, including what you would do with the grant if you won. And the biggest challenge your campus is facing regarding sexual violence and relationship abuse. And I am proud to say when Georgia Smiled has partnered with Participant Media, TakePart.com, Pivot TV, and Students of the World to create awareness about these important issues. I'm so proud of that. I, I want to thank all of my guests today. A special thanks to Chris Johnson and his wife, <laughs> Miyoshi. And a really special thank you to Beverly Gooden, the, uh, the hashtag Why I Stay. Great job. And a very special thank you to all of you at home who purchased my Avery Lasting Love lip gloss. 100% of the net proceeds from those sales go directly to helping women and children and are responsible for grants like these. All right. If you at home want your own version of the Aspire Initiative, you can go to WinGeorgiaSmile.org and you can enter the program right there, or you can do it at DrPhil.com. Remember, it's all free. Use it in your classrooms. Tell everybody about it. You can also go to iTunes or the Android App Store to download the free Aspire News app for your smartphone, which is a breakthrough in technology that could just save your life the moment that the abuse is occurring. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. So long. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. What a great job.